Hi, I'm Andre the Beast, and welcome to the Andre the Beast Show. On this episode, we're going to talk to one of my dearest friends, Robin Monroe. Let me give you a little bit of insight on where we're going with today's topic. And I mean today's episode um, in relationships. And trust me, I don't really talk about relationships on the social media because that's almost like taboo for me. But this episode right here is is going to be so Im- impact with information and true life situations that you're going to be like, oh my God, what the blah, 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 blah is happening here. But it's also an episode that is going to impact, make you reevaluate people that you come in contact with or people that enter your lives. It's going to make you self-aware of people you come in contact with. It's going to teach you values. It's going to teach you strength. And it's definitely going to motivate you. Without further ado, all the way from Dallas, Texas, home of my favorite NFL football team, the Dallas Cowboys, Cowboys, Cowboys. That's welcome to the studio, Robin Monroe. Hey, Robin, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me today. How would you like that intro? Didn't it sound good? It sounds wonderful. <laughs> Robin Monroe, Monroe, Monroe from Dallas, Texas. But really, you're not from Dallas, Texas. You're from Indiana. Let me finish. The part. I was born in a small town. Hey, Jason. <laughs> I thought we agreed that uh, you weren't going to do any singing on this podcast, Andre. He just couldn't help us. You know what? Watch. Indianapolis isn't a small town anymore, but when I was growing up, it really was. Um, but yeah, I grew up, I was born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, and um, I left in 91 okay. to, and moved to Dallas. So yeah. why'd you leave in 91? I mean, was Actually, there... Houston. I'm sorry. I'm confused. I moved to Texas. I moved to Houston in 91. Okay. I uh, met my ex-husband when I was a pharmaceutical rep in Indiana mm-hmm. through a physician that um, prescribed a lot of my drug that I was promoting at the time. And he was finishing up his internal medicine residency in Springfield, Illinois. I met him through the doctor that, you know, we, we just, you know, I did well with the pharmaceuticals he, he liked me whatever so met his friend um dated four months and moved to houston texas in 1991 and pretty much lived a pretty fabulous life there um and if i'm not mistaken you know well to do two career oriented individuals in a nice suburban area um um and then things began to unravel you said it better than I did. I was about to say that, but you did it for me. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, but j- just to, to, to go back a little bit, uh-huh. when I moved to Houston, he was doing his cardiology fellowship. So I was the one that was making the money, not him. So he was still doing, he was in training. Right. And then even after uh, a year or two, I was fortunate enough to get on with a medical device. A, a company that sold IC monitors, which was Hewlett Packard at the time. They had a medical division. So I was able to um, work with them. And again, I, I made a very, a very good income. So he was still in What's fellowship. A very good income? So I was the money maker and he was not. And then we, and we were married. And then when he got into a practice here in Dallas, Texas in 1995 is when we moved to Dallas. Mm-hmm. And yeah, absolutely. I continued to work even when he was in practice. So yeah, we we did a great life. We had a great life. I didn't stop working until I got pregnant with our son. So I I worked for I want to say seven years when he was in our marriage when he was still practice when he was in um, finishing up school or his fellowship and then going into practice. You you mentioned a very good income. Like, what are we talking about? Very good income. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, I want to know how much money you was making. How much, what was you making? So you're when, so personal. When it was hey, all said and, I like wow. being personal. How much money? No, you- when it was all said and done, after we had our son and moved into our second home on the on Lake Louisville, it's like moving on guys in those beautiful homes. Like, like I said, how much money was you making? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> yeah, you're living in guys. You you you're you're bankrolling out there in, in in Texas. Okay, so you was the breadwinner, and 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 he was going through his uh, his schooling fellowship. His mm-hmm. fellowship. Um, then what? Then what transpired? Everything was fine uh, until it was this uh, mysterious text message. We were on a family vacation. Um, in La Jolla or La Costa, we, the resort is where we were. And we were waiting on our family to come in from Dallas because we were going to leave the next day and they were coming in and we were going to have dinner. So I asked my son to look at his father's phone because it was odd they haven't called yet and they should have landed like four hours prior. So he said, hey, mom, this is a weird message. And I snatched the phone and it said, hi, you sexy 52-year-old. I'm horny for you. And that opened up Pandora's box. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> wow. When it opened up Pandora's box, then what did Pandora do? Um, Pandora <laughs> had more boxes that needed to be opened. So okay. when we got home, well, you know, hindsight 2020, you never pay. I didn't. I didn't pay attention to comments, uh, body language, disappearing because when you're an interventional cardiologist and somebody has a heart attack in the middle of the night, you're kind of the cath lab, you disappear, you go to the hospital, it's just normal. Right. So I never questioned disappearing in the middle of the night. In any event, um, there were just a lot of signs that I ignored and mm. the text message just brought to light a lot of things that were going on. In the last eight years of my 20 year marriage, I had no idea that was going on. When you realize that was going on, it had to be somewhat devastating. I know it had to be devastating. How did you? What was what was the next plan of operation? I mean, clearly you had your own career going at the same time. Did it affect your career? Did it affect the the family? Uh, did you just say, you know what, I'm going to deal with this internally so it doesn't affect my son? Uh, how did how was you able to maneuver and still hold your um, your life together? I wasn't able to maneuver because at that time he wanted me to stay at home. So I was a stay at home mom and I gave up my career. So I was a stay at home mom when all of this was going on. Wow. Um, So then what led you to, to the inspiration of pure deception? Was it um, the book that you wrote? Um, And I read the book. Uh, I was at your book signing here that in Indianapolis when you flew in and, I read the book. The book was really mind-boggling. It's almost like a, a Nancy Drew mystery. When you, the deeper you get back into the the book, you go, "Is this shit really happening?" <laughs> you know, how did you? What made you go to that journey to put this in 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 book form to share with people what you had went through? Well, first of all, I wasn't trying to write a book, but I went through a lot of therapy. Um, because let's just backtrack. It wasn't just a text message. If it was just a text message, I think I probably would have worked my way through it. It was beyond that. It was a sexual addiction. It was living a double life. It was doing IVF with a patient. It was it was all kinds. Of, you read the book. Oh, yeah, it's, back up. It, it what was just you, craziness. What do you mean? The, uh, elaborate a little bit more on the sexual addiction and then that other Three three letter word that you use. What what exactly is that? So the viewers okay, can know so what that is. He, uh, so when we got home, I, you know, I've I'll, I always had access. I set up his email account, and when we were on vacation, I said, "You have over six thousand emails. You need to erase some of these." Even on the vacation, he said, "Oh, that's fine. You, you're not going to find anything in there." When he said that, it didn't even resonate in my head anything was going on at that time. It didn't until after, after we got home mm-hmm. and I started to backtrack when we were on vacation on because he didn't close the account or anything. And I noticed in his AOL account, he said he, he changed his Yahoo password. I'm like, he doesn't even have a Yahoo account. So I Googled, I, I clicked on the Yahoo password, said I forgot my password, sent it to the AOL account. When I got the password to go in the Yahoo account, 
Pandora's box opened up again. Mm. Um, sexual, you know, women, young girls, uh, websites, porn, all kinds of stuff. Um, he lived at the strip clubs. He said he stopped doing it. He kept doing it. I mean, it was just, it was ongoing. <laughs> Did you feel like that there was something when you when you saw the sexual explicit stuff and the stuff that you talked about in the book and the stuff that, you, um, that was ongoing from a female standpoint, did you question your... your performances as a woman that may have triggered or like of, did you feel some type of like, what did I do that maybe wasn't fulfilling that, that he had to step out or how did you distinguish the difference between the addiction versus whether or not it was something that you, that you might've done to to delay him down there. He had the addiction way before he, he had the addiction way before the marriage and this is why and this is the explanation when we were not even married but getting going to get married and he was in his fellowship the attending physicians would take the the younger fellows out to the ricks club and all that so he started getting addicted to strip clubs well before any of this so i just thought it was a thing a passing thing that's what the docs do you go out there you do business deals you do yada 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 i didn't think anything of it Right. So when we got to Dallas and he did, and to be quite honest, I knew one of the owners of one of the big clubs and went to Aspen Steen with his girlfriend. And um, so it wasn't a big, it honestly, I didn't even think of it that way because I knew some of these people. Right. He just took it to a whole nother level and just, and it really became an addiction. It became an addiction. Did you, did you then decide to, now you're dealing with, this is your husband. You helped him through school you 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 now realize that it is an addiction and naturally I'm pretty sure your first thought was I'm not going to leave my man I'm not going to dis, dis, disassemble my family um, you're still hurt do you then treat the addiction and try to keep your 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 family intact I'm I'm just Hypothetically, no, I understand what you're saying, um, but it went beyond that. It went beyond. It, it was beyond addiction. Okay, so you so you have that. Mm-hmm. You should have had four DUIs. You only got one because you know you're you're so charismatic. They would just call me, tell me to pick him up, take his license, license, park his car, bring him home. No big deal. Here's the problem: you started having sex with your patients. So now the addiction is spiraling out of control. You're having sex with your patients, and then one of them um, is dating a high-profile older man at my son's private school. So if you get pregnant, he's it's not from him. So they do what's called in vitro fertilization. He was doing IVF with this particular patient. Mm-hmm. So if she did get pregnant, they could say it was IVF. Wow. So that's some serious plotting at the same time to cover to cover the tracks. Right. When did going through this, um, going through this, and I, I know this is, I know this is bringing back memories. I, I'm not trying to do that. Like I said, when we first met and I read the book, I was like, "Wow, you know, this is very, very impactful." And I'm pretty sure uh, other women and and uh, even men have probably gone through this this type of scenario. So sure. it's not it's just not a, a female thing. Um, how do you how do you pick up the pieces? How did you pick up the pieces from going down that 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 trail of self destruction? It's been so long. I, I I actually don't know. I mean, if people ask me the same question you're asking me, I, I don't even know. I guess it's some kind of inner strength. I, I have no idea. Because, I mean, there were times I locked myself after I drove my kids to private school and would drive 40 minutes back home. I'd mm-hmm. go in my closet and cry and just stay there and then get myself together to go and pick them up. Honestly, well, I, and I went through therapy because right. um, I had a nervous breakdown. My girlfriend took me to Miami. <laughs> that was crazy. It's in the book. Right. 
because he saw the crazy individuals we met because honestly i just wanted to get rid of him i'm like you're going to destroy me and do all these things and i didn't do anything to you and i don't understand this behavior and why you want to break up your family and so in any event um have you even had any closure with him to talk about oh, the no, situation no i invited him to our son's graduation last year june 2019 thank mm -hmm. god there was no COVID back then right he attended i shook his hand and thanked him for coming but there's he doesn't have a good relationship with his son so so you think that's part of i'm i'm not a therapist so maybe uh denying narcissism rolled into one right he, he was very narc and still is he acts like he's done absolutely nothing so if he acts like that nothing has been done so the narcissistic side mm -hmm. of the individual will be to divert and to say well you didn't do he, something oh he did so what yeah. did you what what was what was it i guess that's where we was going with the other question so what was it that that individual said that you didn't do that you knew oh. you did oh I, well well, before all that happened, I was a great mother. I was great this and that. But then when he was exposed, I was crazy. I, he feared for his life. That's why he had to leave. I was like, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, you can see why I had to have you on here because I know a beast mentality in, in the female side of a beast. And I know that's what you are. So when I saw that book and we talked and I read I was like man that's that's down here how in the hell are you going to get back to here and how are you going to stay here and you've done that so tell me how did you know let's, let's put that aside because I know that's emotional but in order to get the viewers to understand where we're going from you was at you was already here in your beast mentality from working right. making the money living like you're a geist, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, for those that don't know if you ain't geist, you got some cheese, you know. So you're here, and all of a sudden, boom. Mm -hmm. What were the steps that you took? And I know it wasn't overnight sensation. What were some of those things? Because somebody's out there is listening, and they're going to ask, what did you do? And how long did it take you to go from here to here through this escapade? Because people still, people that, it's funny, somebody's always telling your story from their point of view, but right now you're telling it from the actual perspective. You know, somebody go back, well, Robin knew this, well, Robin, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what did Robin do now to move forward with her life to say, you know what, I'm not going to let this tear me down. I'm going back to that beast level of, of, of who I really was just had to pick myself up i mean because honestly I, I wasn't a beast i mean i was letting it tear me down i took all it was just like one day i had all these bags and sticky notes i don't know if you ever saw the uh uh being mary jane uh yeah on vet with all the stickies i had all these sticky notes i had journals i had everything from my therapy i had bags of it so i just dumped it out one day i looked at it and i got so mad i was like this is the life i'm living i mean i had girlfriends that you know, they didn't want to deal with me because they felt like I had a disease and they were going to get it. Then I had some friends I didn't realize that were my friends and they stuck by me. And so anyway, I'm going through all this stuff and and I got angry about it. I got on my computer and I just started writing. It was like therapy for me just to write down how I felt. So mm -hmm. I can't even remember who it was that was reading what I was writing on the putting in the computer. And, and she was like, she goes, first of all, this is a lifetime movie. And second of all, you probably need to write a book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know how to write a book. So anyway, honestly, I started writing. And then I just started thinking about how I felt. And I decided to attach a quote to how I felt. Mm -hmm. So then I just took how I felt and put a quote to it. And then I just started to outline. And I was like, this is a book. And I literally started at the beginning. So my first chapter of my book is called Lies, Betrayal, and Deceit. How I found that infamous text message. Mm -hmm. And then the second chapter is in the beginning, how we met. You know, I did it in chronological order and how I found out all these things. But then I also went back to, there were a lot of signs there that I totally missed. I've met so many ladies and so many individuals that relate to my story. I'm in shock. Mm -hmm. 
I met a young lady I worked with briefly the earlier part of this year. We still talk, we're good friends. She just texted me last week. She goes, we, she's in Houston, we need to get together. She goes, your story is my story. And she shared it with me and I was like, what? I mean, she was here and went down to here and you know, still trying to get back up. Just like me, she didn't write a book, but she read my book and she said, I had to put it down and I was crying because this is my story. She said, I was married 17 years. This man is one of the biggest architects. We traveled the world. We did this, da da da, and then boom. Mm. Yep, same thing happened. Mm -mm. But I think when you're living that life, sometimes you don't pay attention. And she and I both over drink, <laughs> discuss that there are some individuals that know these things are going on, and they decide they want to stay because they don't know anything else. And what are they going to do if they don't have that? You like talking I about, told you before we got on the air, I'm half Jamaican. My father did not raise me that way, and I wasn't going to put up with it. Even though it was an extreme struggle for me, I just was not going to put up with it. And she was like that, too. But there's certain individuals, they're not going to do that. They're not going to they're gonna stay and do whatever it takes because, you know, there's maybe they don't think they can do it on their own or they just don't have self-respect. I don't know. But she and I had a long conversation, and we just – mesh because she was like girl we have the same story and i met other people that share that and men too okay. men have inboxed me on facebook about their experience which totally shocked me because i always thought it was more of a female thing but it really is not it's a universal thing did you um did you keep this from your family the yeah for about four or five months i was totally embarrassed um totally embarrassed because this wasn't supposed to happen to me how is it affecting your 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 son? Now I know he's graduated. I I follow. He's graduated. Yeah. Getting ready to go to he college. He's doing amazing. No, but I'm gonna be honest. When we were going through the divorce, he was very confused. Um, didn't really understand. He would see things mm -hmm. and kind of like hmm. Um, then becoming a teenager and freshman sophomore year, he just went nuts and crazy. I didn't think the child was gonna graduate. I think he's gonna end up in jail. Right, he right. was just a nut. So the now his junior year, when he wasn't, his dad didn't want to pay for him to go to his private school, and he was there from kindergarten to tenth grade. His junior year, and he went to public school. He um, encountered some very seedy uh, individuals he thought were friends, and they weren't, and that was going to be his demise. But I fought for my son. I mean, he was—he's been my first priority through all of this. It wasn't about me; it was about him. Yes, I made bad decisions when it came to co-parenting and because I couldn't co-parent with somebody crazy. I couldn't do it. And I couldn't co-parent with somebody that was so disrespectful. But so I took upon myself that I was going to raise my son and be the mom and the dad. Some so, people are going to disagree with me. That's fine. But that's what I did. So I fought for him and he did graduate. He did well in school. He got a scholarship, half scholarship. He, He's on the tennis team at Millican University in Decatur, Illinois. Mm -hmm. He's a biology pre-med. He's on the oh, dean's yeah. list, and good. I'm thrilled. Good, good. You mentioned, you know, um, the, the co-parenting. Did it, because of the situations that, that it happened, um, was it, was it um, by choice that you didn't want to do the co-parenting, or did the legal system step in and, and say you had to do co-parenting? With, with when when this was going on, or did you just decide that you know what, based on what has happened to me, uh, I'm just not gonna deal with the co-parenting. I'm gonna try to. Oh no, no, I followed the law. I mean, he had visitation with his dad. Okay. But his visitation, I didn't know until he was a little bit older. He was like, I would go over there. He'd have his whoever it was he was with, and I'd be in my room, and that was his visitation. Isolation. Pretty much. Okay. I did not know that until he was in his sophomore year. So with 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 all that going on, you've now embarked. It's been a couple of years because people re need to realize that book came out. In what year did that book come go viral? Um, it was actually around the 30th of December 2016, and then I started doing uh, signings in 2017. So I was in Indianapolis in March. Mm -hmm. I was in Atlanta twice in June and July, right. and I did a lot of podcasts here in Dallas with various um, individuals here, and um, then my second book, which 
let me back up. The first book, I want to say 50% of it is based on my experience. It's what happened to me. Right. And the rest, I embellished and just made it even crazier. That's why people were confused because <laughs> they didn't know what was true and what wasn't because it was so entirely just unbelievable. Um, so that was the first book, Pure Deception. And so if you've read Pure Deception, um, the second book, Pure Revenge, is 90% fiction. I just took it to a whole nother level mm -hmm. and I was going to write a third book and make it a trilogy right. but I was um, approached by a, um, a Facebook friend who's in the industry and um, met um, with Global Genesis Group and they decided to sign me to do distribution. Um, I'm not a screenwriter so I worked with Jeff Stroy to screenwrite Okay. So and you, Ken you Hoard like who did who wrote High, Highlander I met with him and he said it sucked so I laughed in our meeting. I said, yeah, I'm not a screenwriter, but anyway, we're in the process of rewriting the script that um, that I had written. And with COVID, everything's kind of stopped, which is okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be, it's going to happen. So they're gonna, they want to do a TV pilot and they want to call it Pure Deception. Who's playing, who's playing, a, who's playing your, who's playing your ex? We have a lot of, um, I had a little wish list. I and think Blair Underwood would be actually Blair good. Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who show who show are you on here? Let's... No, 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 no. And Stephen Bishop, I like Stephen Bishop. Actually, he played in Temptation. Okay. He plays a really good, smooth. You know, no, he can do it, nothing wrong, but he is very underhanded. So I need somebody that has that smooth, but they're very deceiving. So, and I have some other people too, but okay. I, I like Stephen Bishop actually because in Temptation, I saw that movie and I was like, that's my ex right there. So anyway. <laughs> okay. okay, I figured you were going to say Denzel Washington. No, uh-uh. Okay. No, and there's well, a Underwood lot is of, nice, yeah. There's a lot of young actors out there that are so good. I mean, I watch all kinds of shows and I'm like, who is he? And I look at his IMD and see what he's done. And yeah, so it'll probably be, who knows what the cast is going to be, but um, yes, yeah, so I've written already eight episodes to do a series. So it's just in a hold pattern right now, which I'm okay. Cause I'm really, you know, my focus was getting my kiddo in school and, you know, he wanted to play collegiate tennis and that worked out for him. So he's good. Now it's back to me again. So, so how do the, how, how, how can our listeners, um, get get a copy of this of the of the pure deception is it still available they can get both pure deception and pure revenge on amazon or kindle and or kindle um that's where they can also order it at barnes and nobles it's not on the shelf but if you go to barnes and nobles you can't order it give give us a little a little bit of insight on the on the second one the the second book you said it's a little bit more of a you know Revenge. Yeah, revenge. Okay, so I'm yeah. gonna read you. I'm gonna read you because I don't want to tell them what happened at the um, end of Pure Deception because obviously right. that's not what really happened. It's fiction. But I went ahead and I did a segue to it um, okay. to get you kind of wanting to to read Pure Revenge. Okay. So the first um, the prelude is what is Pure Revenge? Well, it is the highest level anyone can accomplish when they set out to make an individual pay the ultimate price for how they feel they were wrong. That is what Dr. Richard Casey pursued during the course of an ugly divorce when his wife, Amanda Casey, discovered he was having inappropriate relationships with patients amongst other indiscretions. Instead of facing the truth, he hid behind his lies and denied doing anything wrong. With that being said, he sought out revenge on her. He was like a thief attempting to accomplish the biggest heist, but unfortunately he got caught. He was a sore loser and took it to a level that was unimaginable. In the end, he fell on his own sword in the book Pure Deception, but still refused to be defeated. So now he's seeking revenge again in a different way. On the other side of the coin was Amanda. She was fighting at every turn, angle, and punch brought to her, and she was relentless trying to circumvent the revenge that was originally initiated towards her. She had to use revenge to protect herself, not as a dagger like Dick to get back at anyone. It was her tactic as a survival mechanism in this battlefield of a divorce to maneuver through the landmine she had to dodge and grenades thrown her way. Be very careful when seeking revenge. Beware of the old adage, 
an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It can cause mental fixation to the point you are incapacitated to make sound decisions. Seeking revenge is tactical and planned. It has to be executed to the utmost precision or it will turn on you and you are the one getting burned. Be careful with revenge. It is not for all to seek and all to handle coming out smelling like a rose in the end. That is really, that's, that's really powerful. That's it. That's how the book starts. And then, and then the first chapter is um, New Beginnings. <laughs> wow. That is like really, really deep. So um, moving forward before we end, end our show, you're doing another project now. Um, you're um, ghost writing. I'm ghost writing for a radio personality. I don't want to say her name yet. She's okay. in the Hall of Fame. She uh, reached out to me. She was here in Dallas a right. long time ago. I right. say long time ago, but she left Dallas and we reconnected and she read my books and loved it. And um, she, you know, she has a stellar career. She's done so much and she's, she wants to write a biography. Right. So um, I've already done the first pass and um, actually we're gonna be working on it next week again. So I am most right. So how hard, how, what, what's, what's the difference? And you know, from, you know, you wasn't planning on being a writer, a writer. And it's, no. it's, it's really funny because this show is, is about beast. And <laughs> you know, and, and I'm listening Every guest I've ever had on, man, it's been remarkable with 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 what they've gone through. But here it is: you was in the corporate world, family, married, all of a sudden got to change gears during Mm -hmm. the most tragic time. Become a writer wasn't even in your on your on your on your list, but you navigated because you knew you had something to share. Write another book. Now you're ghostwriting. So when you're ghostwriting. What ex- what what experience are you bringing into that for form into that um, form to be a ghostwriter? What's the difference? Um, there is a difference. The only thing is that I do like that what we're doing that's different is that she is speaking to me and she sends the audio to me, mm-hmm. and then I can hear the inflection in her voice and. So I'm writing what she's saying, and then I go back and change it. So it's a little bit different because it's her story and my, not mine. Mm-hmm. But I told her I like the fact that it's on audio because I can hear the pain about right. certain things. Right. I can hear the happiness in her voice about certain things, right. um, inflection, all those different things. And she looks at it and goes, wow, you changed this up. That's how I really felt. So it's a little bit different, but I actually... I actually enjoy it. So, and it's a challenge, but I like the fact that it's on audio. Some people will send you something and then you edit it and look at it. And just listening to it on audio is a little bit different. So that's how we're approaching me ghostwriting for her. I I, I, I feel you a hundred percent because I know the viewers and the listeners are going, wow, you know, you can, you can hear the, the, the pain in your, interview you can hear the recovery in your interview you can hear the happiness in your interview but more importantly you can hear the rejoice in your interview i like that a lot um i'm privileged to have had the opportunity over the years to have gotten to know you to follow your career to be a part of that career to be a support to your career, uh, you've definitely been an inspiration to both men and women uh, throughout your your uh, your journey. Um, hope that you continue to do wonderful things. And and uh, uh, with that said, come back on the show. Love to have you back on and share with us uh, some more of your ventures. And you know, don't forget your uh, writing the book, Daddy Don't Cry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what just really quickly because yeah. you know I, I don't think i really told viewers you know um uh, d- there's just a couple of takeaways like when you're going through a trying time whether it's divorce or or it's a job situation or whatever you know right. sometimes we just the takeaways are we just need to pay attention to signs that something is amiss and that's something i didn't do you just have to pay attention. It's not like to be paranoid. Pay attention to the signs. And if someone wants to walk away from you, let them walk. I mean, as difficult as it can be, 
can turn your your pain into purpose and you know you support your friends that are are going through something don't run away just because they're going through it it doesn't got, it, it's not like a disease like it's going to happen to you you need to lift your friends up and then finally no matter how bad it gets always remember karma has no deadline you know uh, that and that's true that was beautifully said so with 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 that now you're you you you're in a relationship are you going to forgive the guy that blew up your smoothie <laughs> no, they don't they don't know the, that <laughs> you know what is so interesting you know because this whole situate situation really put my uh, self-esteem to like the bottom of the barrel yeah and there's sometimes you know everybody sees me like oh she just has it all together and there's times you know it may appear that way but i don't and just a really nice person and it's like I was like, do I look nice? He was like, you look nice, but it's all about what's inside of you. Right. It's what's inside of you. So I get all those like coaching skills from him. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> so I didn't even freak out. I mean, I did about the kitchen being blown up, but any other time I probably would have freaked out and I was just like, oh, okay, we'll just have to get it cleaned up. As well. Well, I mean, purple, purple, well, you said pink. It's pink. Pink it's smoothie. It's all pink. All on your walls, you know. <laughs> on, no... dark, on dark hot hardwood cabinets, <laughs> just pink everywhere. <laughs> well, with that said, I know you I know you have definitely gotten back in the beast frame of mind. Andre, there was one thing that um, really resonated with me, especially with the passing of Chadwick Boseman that I didn't get to say, and I really wanted to say because I felt this. He did a 2018 commencement speech at Howard University. Uh -huh. And quote unquote, he said, the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. And I read that and I just bawled today. Yeah. Because I felt that. That was, um, that was, that was very troubling for, I believe the whole world when uh, the passing of that young man at such a, a young age. I think it also goes to show that um, a lot of people didn't know that and that he, um, by not didn't know it, we just felt from his movies and what he brought to the screen that he was strong and he was this, that, and the other. But deep right. down inside, he was going through some serious stuff. And I think we as individuals need to realize that Life is very, very precious, and um, each day should be treated as such. And with everything that we're dealing with in the world, with the uh, pandemic, with racial tension, with the the legal system, with uh, um, law enforcement, we need to all take a moment and look in the mirror and say, did I listen to somebody today? Did I make a change with somebody today? Did I make somebody smile today? More importantly, did I make a difference with not only myself today, but did I make a difference in somebody else's life today? Because life is too short. The death of him should be an inspiration for people to reevaluate, to look at themselves and say, I need to make a difference. We need to stop the bullshit. We're grown individuals. We are privileged to be in the United States. We're privileged to be a part of the human race. Absolutely. And, yeah, and we need to learn from these tragedies instead of making tragedies. Yep. Uh, um, I, I like what you just said. That's uh, very important. And, you know, my, my, my heart goes out to you, not, not, in, a, not in a way of feeling um, um, pain, but the fact that you was able to persevere stay in that beast frame of mind play it forward build and support and keep your family and your friends strong and you said something that kind of dawned on me when you was like you know some of my friends dropped off you know they were never your friends right because friends listen friends support right. friends don't judge friends listen and they understand and they don't criticize they support. So you know what? You didn't lose nothing. You really gained a better group of friends, a right. better group of supporters. Um, with that said, I want to say thank you for being on the show. Please come back again 
on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Please come back. We'd love to have you. And thanks for being on the Andre the Beast show. Thank you.